All right, so now we have some time for a discussion. Um, I guess John and I have microphones. If everyone wants to try and cram into these three seats, you could, or, <laughs> or, or we will uh, run microphones around as people want to ask questions and, and respond to them. Um, I, I'll start with one, which is um, we heard several times today references to um, taking ideas from one field and applying them to another. That was certainly Clement's theme when, when he started, and one of the fields that we heard mentioned in multiple talks um, was aviation, or more specifically, aviation safety, um, right? It's some, some place that uh, probably belatedly medicine has looked for examples of um, standardizing and, and making processes more um, uh, more repeatable and, and more safe. So I think m many of you probably know this is not a digital thing, but, but checklists have come to the, to the hospital um, a, a, as a way of controlling infection and, and uh, making sure that surgical procedures are standardized in, in a way that had long been standard in, in the um, aviation safety industry. So, so my first sort of broad question to any of the panelists is, um, what's another place you think medicine um, and, and smart health um, should be looking for examples? Safety would be another discipline, I think, given the safety problems in clinical cares. Can, can you say a little more about that? Are there some specific things you think could be of interest? Sure. Um, I think modeling would be one way to, and I, I don't think in the clinical care they have any modeling uh, of, like the uh, transportation safety. Uh, simulation, uh, definitely Six Sigma is, yes, we talked about high reliability organization, but Six Sigma would be another discipline we would like to replicate. I think that's a really interesting idea. I think um, you, you mentioned modeling. It, it's, uh, at least in my area of um, cardiac uh, devices and medicine, um, the, the very first cases are now coming where models are being included as part of the FDA approval process. Um, and so, so I think that's a, that's a small step in that direction of, ha of having models be part of the information that you integrate when you're making regulatory decisions. And so, so I think that's along the lines of what you mentioned. We talked a little bit about that uh, during the break, um, game design. Right. If if you think about you know um, all those you know game theories, um, you know behavioral economics is being used to make us good shoppers, uh, addicted to you know various you know social tools and uh, so on. You know why you know can't we use it to make people addicted to good health behaviors? Right. Can can we create good health rituals and get people addicted to that? More value than making us better shoppers. Right. You have to say my, my inner pessimist when, when Charles said automotive was, I was thinking about automotive actually during some of the talks is, um, you know, in, in medicine we know um, that many of the things that we all know would make the biggest impact on health, no one wants to do. Um, and in automotive, that used to be wearing your seat belts, right? Um, but, but, but we fixed that in part by forcing everyone to wear seat belts and in part by putting in airbags. Um, uh, to, to help with, which helps whether you're wearing a seatbelt or not. And so, um, so I, I wondered whether there, uh, the parallels there were a little worrisome for me about whether we can require <laughs> everyone to do good belt health behaviors. But, um, but, but, but at least in Virginia, when you, when you drive into work in the morning and see everyone doing this with their smartphone instead of, instead of driving, you see we seem to be repeating, in, in the automotive field as humans, we seem to be repeating the same things that we've been doing a long time in the, uh, in, in the health area. Uh, so my answer would be kind of generalized in the sense I would look toward any consumer internet company or mobile company, uh, something like Twitter, Uber, for user interface. Uh, physicians today are kind of overburdened by t the type of workflows that they may need to input and, the, and utilizing kind of antiquated EMR interfaces. So any type of user interface that we can design that's really simplified and um, uh, kind of matches the consumer experience today that we're so used to on the mobile phones is vital towards pr uh, producing a usable solution. Great. 
Yeah, I mean, and all, all these examples too, I mean, go back to Clement's point, um, you know, that, that he made earlier about, um, that was echoed by many of the speakers in terms of all the different disciplines that need to be engaged in this. So some of the user experience and, um, you know, relates to, you know, psychology and, you know, all the human factors and ethics and sociology. The, um, and this point of, um, th you know, thinking about health as sort of like medical practice, treating people who have a condition as opposed to, uh, you described it, Clement, as the, the social determinants of health um, and what kinds of investments, you know, should, you know, and, and how should, you know, we as kind of working in the smart health space be thinking about, you know, impacting those kinds of areas as opposed to targeting, you know, existing dis in, um, um, acute or, or chronic diseases. So that rings pretty true. Yeah, I was just going to kind of pile on what everyone was saying because um, if you look at neighborhood industries, I think whether it was uh, games, uh, consumer kind of applications, we're all talking about behavior ultimately. And if you look at a typical type 2 diabetic, they see their physician maybe two hours a year, 20 minutes every other month. The other 8,758 hours a year, they're on their own. Every decision that matters, they make it in isolation. So if you look to retailers and how they actually influence your behavior, whether you realize it or not, that's a window into how we can get over the adherence problem. Because the adherence problem, let's face it, is directly related to the intervention or activity that needs to be undertaken and the immediacy of the impact of not doing it. So, you know, I'm terribly uh, nearsighted, take off my glasses, I can't see anything. You don't have to incentivize me to put my glasses on. <laughs> but, but when you look at all the major conditions that, you know, the, the top five that account for the majority of healthcare costs, what they do or don't do today doesn't really alter much tomorrow. They don't actually feel it. They're a frog sitting on a frying pan that by the time they realize the problem is there, it's too late. So to the extent that we can learn from other industries how you can actually when you go to the grocery store, there's a reason why none of the cereal boxes are ever organized in alphabetical order. Because they're purposely designed to make you actually look at each thing to make an impulse buy. There's a reason why all the fruit stuff are located directly on the right-hand side when you go into the grocery store. It's because they want you to feel healthy buying stuff, then you buy all the crap later. <laughs> whereas, if, whereas if they're really doing it logically, they put the fruit and stuff at the end where you get it, you know, so the, the bananas don't bruise or anything, you just kind of get it and go. But there's a whole art and science uh, about how to influence people's behavior for their own good that doesn't necessarily have to have a digitization that has a surveillance big brother invasion of my privacy approach. And are there, I mean, with all the companies that are here, I mean, are there, how do you engage with like behavioral psychologists as you're thinking about, you know, services and products and whatnot? Is that something that companies actively engage in? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to, we, um, behavioral, Automated behavioral anal uh, analysis is something that we actually do. I'm trying to turn what I can and can't say. <laughs> In the national security arena, there's a whole corpus of work that we do about behaviors, either um, divining patterns that would indicate predisposition for terrorist activity or proactively putting out things to deter it when you see clusters congeal. Um, those activities applied to behavioral health, and, and I, I mean behavioral health generally speaking, not just the, uh, the activity space of interest, is actually very fruitful areas for exploration. Just another sort of industry, I guess we could take ideas from, or I think also partially this is something we could contribute to other industries, is when I think about, especially deployment of analytics, we often don't think about the negative outcomes of the things that we're doing. And so I think that's actually pretty common in medicine. So I was thinking this is something you could almost make sure not to lose, as opposed to something to take from another industry. But just the idea that the technology you're creating is a dual-use technology. 
and not just at the individual level, like if you put a sensor in someone, what could a malicious actor do to that sensor, but what could a malicious actor do in control of a network of sensors that are all embedded in people? And so then in general, the not just the security outcomes of securing your data and securing your individual patients, but also securing society as a whole from negative malicious actors who might take control of these systems or deploy them in ways that you, when you created them, didn't intend to. Mm -hmm. I assume that's something very, you know, it's common in medicine, but not as common in analytics. And so mm -hmm. if we move towards the smart health, we don't, we don't want to lose that, that mm -hmm. worry. Do, do other people have questions either for, for the presenters or just to sort of stimulate uh, discussion? Um, I, otherwise, I, I have one as well. But I want to, I want, we all invited you here because we want to hear, hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, no, please. I have one question um, that is sort of related to the doc.ai that you put um, up at, at, in your talk and related to something that came up in the EIM cancer talk debate about smart health is that, um, you know, we do all want, you know, there is an ethics in wanting to take ownership over our own health. But at the same time, I, you know, I envision that in the future, we're all going to be wearing these devices that, you know, monitor our heart, but they even might do DNA sequencing, something like that. And it, there is like a moral ethics that I kind of worry about that what if we start creating this, um, this community of hypochondriacs where we're all kind of diagnosing ourselves <laughs> and or you know maybe we want to monetize maybe we like sign up for all you know we pretend that we have these illnesses and start monetizing and signing up for all these uh, uh different studies you know and maybe we really don't need to and just questions about as we move into this smart health arena how are we going to still ensure that we are not just living in this constant state of fear of dying, you know, and that we actually are thinking about like whole health and wellness, hmm. you know, and, and, and benefiting from using these devices that way. I'll start, but I'm sure other people would, would want to, you know, contribute. Um, so uh, first of all, I, I think um, there always are people that um, will game the system, but I think the majority of people are innately good. Uh, so if you think that uh, right now people don't, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of usability studies in, in my prior life, and, and we had some people that would be, um, th that we, you know, learn to kind of weed out because they will be chronic participants. Right, they, they would be <laughs> whatever is needed. You know, they they would be you know good for that. And and even people would um, kind of fake and sign up for multiple clinical trials, right? Because they're being compensated. You know, um, and and like now with the unique identification, where uh, kind of those people are being uh, weeded out. I think there is more value in creating more of a citizen science mindset. Um, in, in people than in the, the risk of, you know, a few bad apples trying to game the system. And I think, you know, the, um, it's going to become more and more difficult as the more data is available <laughs> to, you know, for people to, to really game. But, but, you know, going back to uh, having that data, you know, is it going to, you know, make us yeah, think about, you know, illness all the time, right? Um, and, and to me, that's the question of how do we design research? How do we design the product? How do we design feedback um, that, that we don't create that problem? I think it's you know, up to us. I think it's an interesting point, Helena, echoing um, Clement's point about does the world really need another product? Um, I, I think it's worth asking the question. Um, for and, and this will be different for different areas, but um, as someone who does cardiac work, from from the cardiology point of view, we don't need any wearables, right? You need to stop smoking, lose weight, and exercise, right? So so um, so you need a scale, right? You need, you need the same thing Jeff needed for his babies, um, and, and that's it. Um, and so, so wh whether the problem is actually m more data now, the flip side is there's a lot more that can be done on the analytic side about understanding, um, why mobility is low in some parts of the country, why physical activity levels are low in some parts of the country and others. So I think there's a tremendous amount of interesting work to do on the analytic side with data in the aggregate 
But for data at the individual level, for cardiology, we don't need any data. Um, we have all the data we need, which is you're overweight, you should lose weight, and you should stop smoking. But, um, and, and that would be sort of 90% of the battle from a cardiovascular risk factor point of view. Um, so, so it's important to, I think, always go back, back to that every talk that I go to at Cardiology Grand Rounds, the single most important factor for whatever the disease is that day is um, body mass index. So are you overweight or not? <laughs> so one of the questions that I had, and, and you could probably tell with the um, set of, of speakers that we had was people coming from very different, um, very different industries, different perspectives. Uh, we, have, we have companies, we have government agencies, we have um, uh, healthcare systems, and of course academics. Um, and uh, and so part of what we're what our goal is with this workshop, this whole workshop today, is to think about different kinds of partnerships. So how is it that we can work together? It's certainly um, you know complementary um, expertise and interests that you know when used together could um, you know probably enable some some pretty exciting results. Um, but you know that's hard to do and that's something that you know we have to be pretty intentional about as we as we move forward with with these kinds of collaborations and partnerships i think uh locus and and the and the uva medical system and that's a great example of how you know that that came together um do people have sort of you know their thoughts or models about how we can do that i mean how can we leverage the conversations that we've had today into you know effective partnerships uh going forward I'm not sure if it you know, talks about partnerships, uh, but maybe it's laying ground for successful partnerships. Um, what I would like to see is uh, more, you know, for us to be able to answer the question of, you know, partnership to what end? You know, why are we partnering? And what I feel is that we are not spending enough time understanding the problems and understanding what actually needs to be solved, right? Uh, maybe there are opportunities to somehow partner on, you know, falling in love with the problem, not with the solution, and really defining the problem and um, understanding, you know, different aspects of it. Um, you know, all the participants in, in the ecosystem around the problem. What are the, you know, systemic issues? Um, and, and then I think, um, you know, may, maybe partnerships around the right, you know, problem sets uh, will come more naturally. Because oftentimes we're doing this, you know, speed dating or, you know, going through a lot of volume, you know, uh, for serendipity, you know, <laughs> of finding, you know, someone, you know, or something that, that, you know, would click. And it's a very ineffective way. And, and I've been kind of thinking, you know, how can we insert a bit more intentionality? And then the problem definition is my, you know, current hypothesis. But, but I don't know how to ignite it. Yeah, I'm working on that. So if you guys have <laughs> ideas or want to partner. What about other speakers? Um, where, 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 do you, um, where do you look to partner with universities as opposed to doing things in-house? Or where do you, you think some of the I interesting places are um, or for that interface? Um, so I'll say that uh, although um, uh, you know, as a software company, we're trying to be on the cutting edge of our field. Really, um, research organizations are going to be on the really bleeding edge of the field in terms of innovation and our ability to really listen to what are the, the new capabilities for us to include within our platform and see how they're being leveraged already in the research studies is of vital importance. Uh, so new, new ways to, to adopt sensing platforms and have intelligence around the data that we're collecting from these platforms. Um, and then also having a, uh, being a research organization, um, having a ability for us to be able to test our, um, our capabilities um, at UVA Medical System has been um, vital in being able to validate our approach. Uh, so the combination of innovation also kind of a, um, uh, a base for us to test our critical and really um, validating the success of our platform. <coughs> I'm going to chime in on the, your proposal for understanding the problem. So one thing is, 
if you can take from us or from me personally the common uh, <coughs> health care that um, DHA has and, and it's probably uh, global problems as well and talk to the students, prepare them, let them read, let them understand how to approach and understand some of those, if they are engineers, uh, they can get some clinical discipline or health uh, discipline and apply some of the maybe open source to, to solve this problem, play with the data, play with the terminologies, stuff like this, practical stuff, and then try to approach us and try to build the brand with it within the organization and reputation. And, and then many things will follow through this model. Yeah, I'll take that opportunity to make w one shameless plug for the embedding stuff that we've been doing with the students in engineering and medicine. Part, part of the motivation for that program came from my own experience with graduate students in my lab, um, because a lot of what I do in my lab is working closely with cardiologists, and so, so frequently the PhD engineering students, um, I would force them to actually go spend a certain, you know, an afternoon a week in the clinical environment with the cardiologists, and, you know, sometimes they got bored and sometimes it wasn't, but, but just to really be immersed and understand that environment, and every student that has done that in my lab um, ended up getting their next job, not because of the research, the actual topic of the research that they did in my lab, but because of their familiarity with the clinical environment and, and the ability to, to communicate with clinicians. And so, so it was a joke for a while that nobody from my lab who graduated, actually, they all got jobs with device companies, but none of them were cardiovascular device companies. They kept getting jobs with you know orthopedic device companies and other things that were kind of unrelated to their research. And they wanted them because they could have the, they understood the clinical environment and could have the conversation yeah. with, the, with the clinicians. But even even if you don't have access to the this experience, right, just mentor them for what, how to read stuff, uh, how to build the knowledge, basic knowledge. Believe it or not, this basic checklist, sometimes we don't get it from our contractors, mm -hmm. a multi-billion contractor, multi-billion dollars contractors. So basic stuff like this, basic discipline, um, internship, uh, I think uh, would, would set the uh, tone for um, more activities to come. That's great. Clement, you want to win? I apologize as always having to walk from the back, but I, uh, I can't stand sitting down <laughs> because you haven't figured it out. Um, no, I, I think what you said is actually spot on. The, um, the framing of the problem correctly really makes a big difference. And so, and it has to be framed in a way that um, authentic, kind of like how Locus and UVA work together on a very specific substrate of a problem related to pediatric cardiology that then branched down into neonatology, but it, it was meeting a very specific unmet need, which is the replication of a high-intensity environment, and then you went from a one to a zero, and what can you do about it? So we have to be very um, explicit in doing the customer demand function problem definition kind of thing. But then think about, then be multidisciplinary in how we go about it. So if we think of um, the DHA or the VA, I mean, a really big problem is suicide. And, and it's a manifestation, an end stage manifestation of a behavioral health issue, as is opioids. Opioids could be a reflection of um, an epidemic of loneliness, et cetera. And so there are certain levers, certain modalities that we think about in addressing the problem, but we, ne we perhaps probably haven't thought about it in terms of augmenting that with an entire precision medicine underneath it, an omics approach interdisciplinary along with the, uh, the more traditional approaches to the problem. And I think if, in terms of potential collaboration, it could be coalescing around a specific very high demand problem that has not had an interdisciplinary approach to experiment to see if that would be efficacious in creating better results than we're having right now. Because in a lot of cases, veteran suicide, et cetera, it's not getting better. So. Do you have anything you want to add? 
just a, a follow up on some of the discussions about the roles of, of, of students in all of this. I have some of them uh, um, of my own uh, sitting here as well. I mean, one of one of the um, things we really want to do, in addition to the um, to the embedding um, that we talked about, um, that that Jeff talked about here at UVA, we do feel like things like internships and other types of you know direct experiences in in various companies can be a tremendous um, educational opportunity for the students, and it's also that opportunity too to to have them understand those real world problems that they can then bring back to the research lab here. Um, and you know that's something that we as a, as a lab really want to support. So actually one of the things that we that we did um, recently was basically put together a resume booklet uh, for all of our students. And that was part of our motivation for having the, those flash talks this morning as well on the poster sessions is to really connect you all um, you know, directly to the, to the people who are doing the work are, who are the students, of course. And so, um, you know, we really, you know, want that to be part of our relationship with the companies going forward is, is those, those opportunities for the students. That'd be great. I'll, I'll throw out one more general question um, to all the panelists, which is one one of the things uh, that came up a number of times today was was thinking about things from the consumer perspective, right? And and starting with Clement, who I think very rightly said that actually, if you ask people, most people would prefer to have a lot less healthcare <laughs> um, and as few interactions with the system as possible. Uh, wh one of the things that's often claimed is is that. Um, it's uniquely challenging to be a healthcare consumer, um, both on the technical side, because it's so hard to figure out what's going on every time you interface with the system, and also on the economic side, because you can't figure out what anything actually costs. Um, how do you think about the unique features of healthcare and being a consumer of healthcare in, in the way you um, think about your your businesses and your and your healthcare innovations. How does that affect what you do? I, I think one 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 variable, and and I think it has a room for improvement is for the for us as a patient or a consumer to understand what information I need to give to my physician, and how do I focus? What what are the relevant things? How do I describe my complaints? How do I feel m my symptoms and articulate them? I think that there is a there is a huge uh, piece to it, and I think that would be the next generation relationship between physician and patient. Uh, instead of the instead of the provider guessing what would be the problem set and giving you stuff that maybe has an adverse effect on your health, there is there are a lot of uh, anecdotal stories about how patients really knew what they need and and maybe the the, the course of um, medication and then they even uh, overperform their provider mm. especially in some cases some chronic cases and some even uh, critical cases like cancers yeah I would say uh, first first we need to recognize that all healthcare is not created equal um, if you want to see where healthcare is truly consumerized, look at cosmetic surgery. And, and the reason why that happened was because insurance didn't cover any of it. If you paid 100 cents on the dollar, so therefore, as a consumer, you expect dollar, uh, value for dollar. So LASIK eye surgery, right? 20 years ago, thousands of dollars, iffy outcomes. Today, it's like, you know, get one eye done, get the other one free. You know, Morton's crazy day sale price. There's one in every corner. And, and that's one class of healthcare. But then there's another that it becomes more consumerized when you have a confluence of, of which the care moves from the intuitive to the probabilistic to the deterministic. 
So you have to evolve the technology with the clinical care and the outcomes and the business model simultaneously. So for the retail clinics, the reason why um, Minute Clinic and um, places like that work is because they only deal with these 37 conditions. And every one of them are deterministic. You go in there, you have a swab, you have you know, um, some throat infection or you don't. Uh, you know, and, and you solve with anti antibiotics or you don't. And so I think in some ways, you can see some of this starting to happen. Like Geisinger will do uh, coronary artery bypass grafting under a fixed price prospective payment and a 90 day money back guarantee. That, that, that will work with certain conditions, it won't work with others. So I think consumerism and healthcare will always have this, will always be like Brazil. It's, Brazil's the country of the future. And always will be, <laughs> okay? So, so we're always trying to chase this consumerism thing, but I think it'll work in many cases. But the reason why it ultimately falls apart for certain cases is because there's always gonna be a top 10 leading causes of death. It's just what it is. And sooner or later, it becomes a moral issue because then we have to sit there and look at, is there a way to create morbidity compression or, or let it happen in a more effective way? Because almost, if you look at the distribution of costs in the health system, and how much is actually being spent in the last six months or year of life, it's because of the American predisposition to not accept death. And, and that, that's a whole, I, I kind of went from consumerism to that. <laughs> so, but, but I'm just trying to show the dynamic range of what may be possible versus what will not be possible. Um, I have kind of would like to hear from students because they have been very quiet here. Yes, they have. <laughs> I even told them at the beginning that they were supposed to be thinking of good questions to ask at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so just like not to put you guys on the spot, but what do you think? <laughs> you know, wh what, what are the problems that you're grappling with? What would you like, wh what would you want to know? I have one question uh, that I was thinking from the beginning when you guys put on the board that healthcare should, or at least one model of the business should be like a service as a service, yes. like the retail clinic or like that. But uh, like considering other services like Uber or those kind of examples, the difference with healthcare is like healthcare is a lot more dependent on the trust and also the like there is so many layers of trust associated. And I think one of the slides from you was like, had all these points about fairness and all of that. So how, how, are, how, will, that, how will that barrier, all those barriers be overcome and have healthcare as a service, like the way that we are thinking? It, it's no longer a service now, it's a, it's a, it's a value based. So we, we are trying to shift from being a, a service fee based industry to value-based industry. So that's one thing. Okay. Um, I, I would also say that, um, and this is why, you know, I think, you know, many of us are emphasizing um, multidisciplinary teams because healthcare is harder problem. It's a systemic problem and you have to look at you know different aspects of it, and some things will be easier. Th those are that you know acute binary choices, you know really measurable. Though those can move to kind of service and, and um, easier, where it's not going to be questioned. There are other things that are be behavioral, where you kind of it, it's it's a longer term. It's you know, especially like in the space of you know chronic conditions. Um, so building, you know, changing behavior and building trust uh, is um, something that you cannot just engineer, right? You need other perspectives, you need other disciplines. So I, I you know, have a question sometimes when I work with students um, that I ask, you know, do any of you want to um, start a company to do a startup? Yes, no, no one, <laughs> maybe. Um, so imagine if you uh, did this, you know, startup around something that, that you're doing, doing research. 
and and I'm not asking tomorrow, right? You know, so don't, don't be afraid that you're. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting your students to you know quit research and, and become entrepreneurs, uh, but if if you did that in the next uh, few years, um, who would be your co-founder? What skills? do you not have and you would need to have in your co-founder to be successful, right? Or even maybe in your current research. It's, it's very important to know what you are, but it's more important to know what you're not and, and where do you need to supplement yourself. Do any of you want to answer that question? I think the list will be very long. <laughs> yeah, that's your friend. <laughs> <laughs> <No>, but <laughs> thanks. But I think the list will be very long if you because we are still students and we are working on like one specific areas. But I mean having the experience of working in a collaborative environment, but going for a startup, I think there is a lot more specifically from the commercialization perspective. That I think will be the first like Without that kind of expertise, I would think the startup will sank within the first month, right? Without having someone who knows how the money is flowing all over the place. So. Do you have a friend from the business school? Maybe you need to befriend someone. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do a startup with a friend. <laughs> no. Not necessarily like answering the question, but. Something that I've been thinking is, as, and as everyone is, is been uh, talking about like these collaborations between industry and like you know students, etc. Like uh, I don't know if like companies actually think it's like balance between uh, like keeping uh, these uh, students still being a student and like keep doing research and not just like uh, making what they are working on on is into a product like. Because I feel like sometimes, like when you start like collaborating with industry, then more like you develop these solutions, and uh, you forget more about the research and the fundamental things part because that's what matters for the companies. And it you, you do you do the things in um, probably in a, an efficient way, but that doesn't mean that it's going to push the knowledge of the things that you are um, I don't know like that you can contribute to to the society in general. So I don't know like how companies actually like think about it or like how, how do they think that they could keep this balance between like uh, collaborating with students uh, and developing these products but al while also uh, allowing them to, to actually do research? Um, I think it's a good question. Uh, I work for a small startup company uh, that um, we're developing biosensors as well as my job here at UVA. And I think um, it got bought out by a larger company a few years ago and one of the issues was just that, that the, c the president at the time was so focused on getting a product. He kind of was pushing through, um, like making mistakes in the research element because he was wanting to reach an end goal. And the current CEO really wants to keep the startup as a small R&D rather than trying to make a factory, let's pay other people, let's you know, have people buy out the product so that we can keep doing fundamental research and, and developing new, new avenues um, where to go. And I think you know, Link Lab is doing a really great thing in trying to find ways to synergize um, academic research with bringing in companies, because I think that could be a way um, for the future is that companies can outsource fundamental research to universities and so that the researchers can keep doing what they do well and letting like the CEOs of these companies um, find the money you know and find and find the direction yeah yeah um, anyway so that's what I was thinking but um, on that note uh, something that I've been thinking about recently um, is, you know, when you say we embed, we're trying to embed medical, you know, nursing students um, in the engineering side and uh, engineering students in the clinical side. We have an EIM um, grant that's doing just that, but I keep thinking, why don't we also get people from the business school, Darden School of Business, uh, embed them into projects and so we can make these entrepreneur, you know, so that we can have an entrepreneurial element to our research and then help undergrads start um, spin-off companies, right? I mean, 
that so I keep thinking that there's there's ways to really or maybe do this career school of education and have education students coming in and doing outreach based on the science that the universities are doing. So I feel like there's really a way to to start doing that here and, and I think the Link Lab and some of these initiatives that are coming up at in UVA really have um, opportunity to try and like kind of broaden our scope, I feel. I have a funny story actually about that that goes back to Clement's question of do we really need another I don't think he said this, I think he said product, but I'm going to say app, um, which was um, we, we ran three iterations of a class, of a graduate class here, um, that was supposed to be modeled after Stanford's biodesign program that puts engineers and, and clinicians, physicians together. Um, that program is designed to produce startups, and they're almost always um, apps, occasionally devices, right? Um, we accidentally did something different. Um, which is when we went looking for the student teams, instead of just inviting folks from the engineering school, um, we did engineering, Darden, so business, architecture, and nursing. Um, and we put them together in teams and we sent them into the clinical environments to, to spend, they spent the first couple of months observing and identifying problems and then figured out what they wanted to tackle, proposed a prototype solution. Um, we ran 15 teams through in three years. We never got a device and we never got an app. Once you got a broader perspective of students on the team sitting and watching in the clinic, no one ever thought that the biggest problem was you needed this thing. The, all the things that came out of it where you need to completely change how the operations run, right? You need to change the architecture of hospital rooms. You need, they came up with all kinds of exciting stuff, but it was never that you needed another thing. It was always something about process and the way the place runs. And I, I found that really, really revealing and resonant with, with what you talked about at the beginning, Clement. Yeah, absolutely, because the problems were systemic. <laughs> So uh, I think from a student's perspective, or like, so when I became an engineer, I wanted to work in the area of health because I wanted to, like, for human health care or something, right, welfare, that, from that motivation. But I didn't know what problem I should pursue, right? And when I work in this lab uh, with Professor John Locke, and when he's collaborating with the doctors, they bring the problem on the table, like this is a health issue that uh, we all think can be solved using engineering. So, and then I'm trying to go back to your point that we have to love, fall in love with the problems, not the solutions, because we know what our solutions are. Like, at the end, just run some machine learning or make a sensor system or something like that, right? But finding the problems is hard. And, like, without this kind of collaborations, we don't really get what problem to solve or what problem to go for. But, uh, I mean, all, this question is for all of you industry people. Is like more like, how many of your websites have research questions that you want answered for, right? Listed. I mean, it's not there. So, and the same from other schools. So, unless we go for a collaboration with some specific people, we don't really know what questions. So, when you say like that, there should we should make a resume book of projects. The same goes for you guys as well, I believe, because you should also have a problem book. <laughs> That's why, I mean, we, in my presentation, I, I talked a lot of, discussed the platform and opportunities too. So I'm happy to give you a long list of problems <laughs> and questions. Yeah. No, I think that will be helpful for, like, not only for our group or something specific or like this is smart health, but right. maybe like all the three branches of like the Link Lab. Yeah. They can so pick their own problem and like go for that. We, we definitely can. Uh, I, I agree with you. There's definitely a skills from the industry to, and, and, and it's not common, to, to frame the problem and questions and give you guidance. I think that's, that's a, it's a difficult one. Um, however, is, there is also uh, a burden on the, on the student side to, to get, uh, show the excitement and show the motivation and the self-learning uh, type of stuff uh, as well and, and try to intrigue the person across the table or the, uh, the potential employer or the organization to come back and, 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 and talk about the problem that they have. Uh, so there are two difficult uh, variables on both <laughs> sides. But. Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, to add to that, um, I heard like a really nice uh, quote. I, I 
forgot, you know, who maybe so I would love to give an attribution. I forgot who that was, but uh, the, the idea is, uh, you know, um, stop trying to be interesting, you know, spend more time being interested. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and that's, you know, like when, you know, I, I try, you know, to be curious myself and, and, and to me, you know, smart, curious people, there, there is a phone in the box. <laughs> that, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I, I know it's difficult from, you know, for students, you know, not having so much exposure and understanding the real world, um, you know, problems. But, but to, you know, say I'm interested in this problem or that problem, you, you don't know what you don't know, but uh, just showing that you are, you know, curious and you want to, w want to work on something that has impact and that you have, you know, a discipline to pursue something. But, but going back to, right, we do need, I feel like we need more purposeful, you know, approach to, uh, so, so some people mentioned hymns, right, you know, on the floor of hymns. And to me, you know, is a visual manifestation of the problem we have in the, you know, digital health innovation. Because when I look at that floor and all those companies, and, and it just goes on, on you know, uh, for miles, and I think about all the money that they raised to be doing what they're doing and, and being being able to buy those expensive booths at that you know trade show. And then when I go talk to them and how little of interesting solutions they actually have, <laughs> um, it's maddening for me. So I would say that we don't have a lack of innovation, we don't have a lack of money, we have lack of intentionality. And it, and um, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, how can we improve that? And, and to me, you know, as I'm saying, like, can we see that with better problems? And if we have better problem definitions and we have, uh, you know, there is the problem, there is an ecosystem of players around the problem, uh, this is the addressable market, you know, uh, that you know around that problem because even those companies that you know raise the money then they go and they try to research and re-answer the same question you know can we give them a kind of a play like what can we do to give them a playbook around the problem and then um, you know what kind of like mini ecosystems can be formed around the problem in different dimensions of that problem uh, because going back to I, I feel uh, one of the reasons why we don't have successful big exits, right, for startups in, in this space, because it's difficult, it's systemic, it, because it's personal, it's emotional, it's behavioral, more so than many other problems. I'm, I'm gonna get off my high horse now. <laughs> <laughs> Should we wrap up? Sure. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yes. one more comment. Hi, I am a second year PhD student. I'm in the CS department. So uh, one of the problems I'm facing uh, right now in one of my projects is the lack of real world data. So I'm uh, working with the non-adherence. I mean, uh, as you know, the adherence to the medical treatments is a uh, very complex problem. So uh, one of the problems I'm facing is that, uh, uh, first of all, I am trying to find some rules uh, or the context uh, at which the patients are taking their medications or in what conditions the patients uh, are not taking the medications. But the problems I'm facing here is to find the rules. That means I don't have much data. So do you believe the healthcare industry can help us, uh, us to bridge that gap uh, by providing that, uh, that data? Because uh, right now what I have is simulated data because I uh, work with the smartwatch. I, I pretend that I will take that pill at that stage or not, but uh, there is a uh, real lack of the real world data or the data from the patients. So that's it. Um, I would say that probably you know, these companies, and there are millions of companies working on adherence problem, and, and they have their own data, and they're not going to share their data. <laughs> 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 right? Um, so you know, we talked about interoperability and <laughs> you know all those issues uh, but 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 maybe what you can um, you know approach companies that do have uh, solutions and, and 
you know, maybe there is an opportunity to do research with them. But, but in general, around the issues of not, not adherence, uh, I think Wendy would, would have um, knowledge or, or access to the research that was conducted around the you know, adherence, so, so maybe she can help out. This is Wendy Nielsen. She's the yeah. lead program um, director of the Smart Infected Health Program at NSF. Yeah. Here, here's an advice. Um, so I work from the data a lot, and, and, I, and, and I draft protocols with many people. You can, you can ask for data uh, with one constraint that you will ask de-identify data. Yeah. And you will, get, you will get data from uh, any federal organization that has typical data, including us. Uh, as long as you will ask the data de-identified and stuff like this, we definitely can, um, generally speaking, we can. I, I don't promise, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Behavioral, uh, what, what he's looking for is Medication, yeah. Medication, uh, data. But, but behavioral data on, on, on adherence. Okay. Uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, what I'm asking that in one, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of behavioral, but it can be more like, with, yeah, but with data, like from our perspective, we have a large EHR and we capture who has diagnosed with what and what type of medication we take, uh, it, it this person um, get dispensed uh, medication for. So what you can do is you can, you can do some analysis yeah. on, on how this person comes back for the same medication in the same cycle, okay. stuff like this. Um, I don't think we capture the, the adherence in details or the behavior behind it, but there are always a proxy yeah. for, for or, or some aspect of the, yeah. of the data. Yeah. Last word. Yeah. Not really much help for you since Sasta, the company I work for doesn't produce data, but sort of a, a addendum to that or an idea on that is when I think about sort of like machine learning for image recognition, for example, for many, many years, there wasn't like a lot of meaningful progress in improving the be the benchmark performances until people started releasing these benchmark data sets basically that are publicly available for everyone and everyone starts to compete to try and get better performance and as soon as those benchmark data co sets come out you know every month every week you start to see performance increase and so i think it, it doesn't actually help you but i think in the future it'll be very desirable for all these industries to get those benchmark data for you because as they see i, I think it it is harder in health because you have this issue of privacy and just these images is super easy and it doesn't it doesn't really matter who gets them but i think it'll be that'll be a useful argument to make for why you should have more access to the data which is if everyone has these benchmark data we can actually compare and i think like in my talk i talked about detecting <coughs> those microcalcifications everyone who does that all the research papers they all use different data sets so they all have different performances and you can't really compare what they did to see who did any better because they don't use the benchmark data. And if, if there was benchmark data, I think that would drastically improve the rate at which their research gets done. Yeah, I think that's a, a, maybe a good place to leave it for, for all the students, too, that, um, that one of the valuable roles that we can all play um, at universities is that when you do collect data, right, making it available so that you're starting to contribute to solving that problem insta in, instead of uh, uh, perpetuating that problem for the next person who wants to work in the area. So thanks so much for all of our speakers today and the students for engaging in the discussion. Anna, finally, I, my, I couldn't get you to talk, but Anna did a great job, so she got you to talk. So thanks so much, everybody, for a great discussion.